And Tony, you're going to sing. Okay, Tony's going to come and sing for us. Uh, this one is a favorite song of mine, but I just just think of what is waiting for us on the other side and what we're going to be trading from this life to the next. And I've just been thinking a lot about, well, Lois, Mike's mom and my sister. We just lost her 14 months ago. And there's just certain things that'll, that's Lois, or Lois sort of like that. And our green, this is her favorite color. So, but then you think of Sue and she's been gone three years, mama seven. It just doesn't seem possible. And daddy 17 and they're waiting for us Amen. and just waiting for Christ to stand up off his throne and for God to say, go get my children. But, um, just think of what we're going to be leaving behind when he says, come up. Yep. But I don't know if you had, I can see mom and probably Mike's uncle, Grandpa Glenn, I'm going to say uncle, I don't know why I keep saying uncle, and apply some of these verses to what he saw that they had to go through, but then look what I'm trading. And seeing mom lying there, you know, with the cancer and feeble and her mind says she could get up and do things, but the body wouldn't let her. But we knew when Jan saw mom take her last breath in that split second, quicker than the twinkling of an eye, she was in the presence of Jesus. And that's worth living for to be in his arms. I once heard a story of a sainted old mother who had lived out her life here on earth. As she lay on her deathbed, her friends gathered round her. These were the last words she said. Oh, look what I'm trading for a mansion. Oh, look what I'm leaving behind. Oh, look who will be there to greet me when I step into sweet paradise. I'm leaving behind all my sorrow. I'm leaving behind all my care. I've traded it all for a mansion that Jesus has gone to prepare. Well, her hands were so feeble and her voice was so low, but she still had a smile on her face. She said, I hear singing and they're waiting for me. Then she looked toward heaven and said, Oh, look what I'm trading for a mansion. Oh, look what I'm leaving behind. Oh, look who will be there to greet me when I step into sweet paradise. I'm leaving behind all my sorrows. I'm leaving behind all my care. I've traded them all for a mansion that Jesus has gone to prepare. Oh, look at what I'm trading for a mansion. Oh, look at what I'm leaving behind. Oh, look who will be there to greet me when I step in to sweet paradise. I'm leaving behind all my sorrows. I'm leaving behind all my cares. I've traded them all for a mansion 
that Jesus has gone to prepare. Amen. Dinner uh, will be at 2 o'clock tomorrow. Thanksgiving dinner will be 2 o'clock tomorrow, so don't forget that. Brother Mike Williams, come with and give us what the Lord's put upon your heart, would you? Amen. Could be me. I'm sure it is. Because ain't nobody up here with a microphone. <laughs> so it's got to be me. Do you want me to even mess with it? Okay. I'm not sure. <laughs> Okay. I thought about just turning it off. That'd be easier. I won't. The little light disappeared. There, the light's back on. It's gone. It's blinking. Okay. Um, I thought, um, Lord help us this evening. We'll finish the message. Uh, actually, the message was finished last night uh, for, for that particular thought of it. But um, I still want to continue the thought of... Um, you know, um, just tell you what. You know, as far as there, oh, you won't hear it through the. That's okay. Well, I, I, that's what I thought. I thought I thought I got a big mouth, but I thought, well, I wonder about the live streaming if it gets it through there. Oh no, I, I I believe it. That's why my name is Mike, it's short for microphone. You know, um, the passages of scripture we talked about last night. If I just kind of give it a recap, we were uh, we were in First Thessalonians, which is where I'm going to be again this evening. If you want to take your Bible and turn to First Thessalonians chapter five, I'll be looking at uh, two verses of scripture. Um, but we were sharing about um, that in uh, a couple of passages of Scripture there in First Thessalonians, I believe in chapter 3, verses 12 and 13, and um, the, the verbs increase and abound, and the idea of increasing and abounding in love, or agape, God's love, um, with respect to heart holiness and sanctification, and then also in chapter 4, there was this uh, concept and idea of what um, heart holiness or sanctification is. You see in verses 3 through 8, you kind of get a picture. Paul gave an example of uh, holiness versus immorality, <laughs> I guess you might say, as far as like this is how it is, you know, because God didn't call us to be unclean in this world, but God called us to grow up as Christians and to be holy and spotless and pure and blameless without, uh, without blame before him in love. So that's what we need to be, and that's what we ought to be for our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. And uh, if you have your Bibles again, uh, like I say, First uh, Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. Brethren, pray for us. <laughs> this idea of heart holiness, and I don't, I don't intend to hold you real long. There's just, just a handful of things I want to say about this that I feel uh, strongly impressed to say. You know, there's this uh, idea of, of growing and growing in God's grace, and growing in God's love, and that was what we shared about uh, last evening, again, with the idea of increasing and abounding in uh, God's agape love, but um, there's, like I said, I'm not going to stick on this very long, I think this will be a short sermon, um, I think one of the things that people look at in their life 
and they they wrestle with and struggle with. And I know that not everybody's doctrinal position will agree with mine. And uh, um, you know, I don't uh, I don't hate them, and I hope they don't hate me. But uh, I just believe it because it's what I see in Scripture, because God's promise was uh, purity. God's promise was um, a clean and pure and sinless heart. You know, and, and um, the, the idea is not uh, with regard to man's judgment of what holiness or purity ought to be, but it is uh, God's standard when God lives and dwells inside the heart of mankind. What he makes and what he can do in the soul of a man. And um, as I stated last night, there are different denominations that believe in different ways. They believe, and we believe, you know, whether people would admit it, we believe too. Um, you know, um, I know I want to say the, I want to say with respect to, let me jump, grab one out here. I believe like the Lutheran Missouri Synod. I think the uh, part of their concept and idea of holiness is like uh, we are sanctified or we're made clean, you know, like um, through the, through sacraments and things like this, but also through the reading of God's word. And uh, whether we would want to admit it or say it that way, we believe that, too, because the more we are increasing and abounding in our love towards God, the more and the deeper we're getting into his word, the more that we believe and personally accept that God's word is genuinely uh helping to work a reformation and a change and, and cleansing us and, and making us pure. But the genuine, uh, the, the bottom line on this idea of this sin nature, what I, I call, see, this is where a lot of them, where their disagreements come. And, and like I say, I can't help that. But um, my personal belief and understanding of Scripture and with respect to our denominations uh, stand on this. Uh, as far as from a Wesleyan Arminian position, is that we believe that holiness is not only uh, possible uh, in this that entire sanctification or the removal of that inherent depraved nature with which man was born. We believe that it is not only that God can not only remove it, but that He calls us to it. That's why I said that the title of this, you know, whatever you know terms you want to take. You know, this is the will of God, your sanctification. And, um, and that's what Paul's prayer here was, that he would pray that God would, um, that their whole, and the, it's interesting because that, that word there, I'm not going to get deep into this, but I'm just saying that word there, he uses the word whole and uh, uh, twice um, as far as God's, the depth, the depth and how far God can cleanse and change. It's only used one time in Scripture, and that's it. That's that passage right there. It's like Paul's inventing word to say this is how deep it goes. This is how uh, powerful it is. And then the other one is only found there and also in James. I want, I want to say James chapter 1. Uh, my, but I'll have to go back and look at that. But um, they both uh, carry on this idea of completeness. Of a complete cleansing. You know, the idea that Scripture equates uh, the idea of, of cleansing, and you've heard us share this before, and but I'm going to remind you again, the idea of uh, cleansing and heart purity that is demanded in Scripture. See, you know how we ended that? If you remember, recall what we said last night at the end of that, you know, it's, uh, and, and even the Scripture itself said that, that if you are rejecting uh, this this call, you're not rejecting men. You're not rejecting man's ideas. You're not rejecting some idea that I'm laying out before you. You're rejecting God's call. I mean, his call is to be holy. Why, doesn't it tell me in the book of Hebrews, he said, follow peace with all men and holiness or the sanctification without which no man shall see the Lord. That's a pretty big statement, isn't it? You know, uh, this idea of holiness and heart purity, you know, and, and uh, can it be possible in this life? Yes, it can. And I, I want to share right now um, a, a couple of things. God help me with this is there's a difference between spiritual perfection and practical perfection. You know, and when it says the Bible says that God circumcises the heart, I don't want to get dirty or foul. God protect us and keep our minds clean but you are when you an individual is circumcised they don't cut off a little bit of the skin 
one day and then a little bit more a couple of days later and a little bit more a couple of days later and a little bit more. No, it's excised in a moment. And when God speaks of this idea of sin or this state of sin with which man is born, he refers to it as something. See, God has one remedy. I, I know you've heard me say this. God's got one remedy for sin, and that is its destruction. God has one remedy for sin, and that is the removal of sin. And people say, can that happen in this life? Can I be pure in this life? Can I be blameless in this life? Yes, yes, yes. Because the promise is what God said. What God said is true. And he said, I'm going to put my spirit inside a man. Well, if I look at that, then God says, listen, I don't know and I don't understand all of what the holiness of God is. I really don't. But I know this, that uh, his holiness and his purity destroys sin. It won't, and God won't take up residence and live and dwell where there's sin until he removes it, until it's destroyed. Amen and amen, Brother Williams. That's the truth. Because what God promises you and I is not something whereby we, some, something where I have to struggle with and I don't have victory over. Because see, man's born with this thing in his heart and in his life that's like, I don't want God and I don't always want to obey God and I want to make war with God. But God says, I want to take that nature and I want to destroy this uh, inherent depraved nature, this bent towards sinning, and I want to give you my spirit. I want to give you my spirit, which is a spirit of love and a spirit of purity and a spirit of goodness and kindness. And that's why Paul says the whole thing. I pray, God, your whole, you know, the whole entire thing be sanctified. And the idea when I said that word is only used there once, uh, that that particular word that he uses is, is one time. It means and it carries with it the idea and concept. It is complete. It's complete. It's not a po partial act. It's a complete act that God does. You know, um, <laughs> morning sun, light of creation, grassy field, a velvet floor, silver clouds, a shimmering curtain, he's designed a perfect world, I'm amazed. At his talent, stand in awe of one so great. Now my soul begins to sing out to the source. From which it came. Bless the Lord who reigns in beauty. Bless the Lord who reigns with wisdom and with power. Bless the Lord who reigns my life with so much love. He can make a perfect heart. These passages of scripture that I was reading a minute ago, all of them remember, he said um, that he would preserve you blameless you know, spotless, without anything that can be marked against you, you know, f so you'll be blameless when Jesus comes. How can he preserve you blameless if he cannot make you blameless? Amen? Now, you look at me this evening. Hmm. This is borrowed. My shirt is borrowed. 
my jacket's borrowed. I mean, I came up here, and they, normally them, they tell me, don't bring anything. We got clothes that'll fit you, you know. So this is borrowed. My socks are borrowed, you know. I mean, all these things. This microphone is borrowed, <laughs> you know. Everything that is about me is borrowed, you know. But there's one thing that's not borrowed. And that's the holiness and the purity that God has inundated me with. That uh, I don't know, I don't want to get into arguments about righteousness imparted and righteousness imputed. But this I do know, that God has genuinely made me a brand new person inside. I'm not what I used to be. I'm not like I used to be, but I'm clean, I'm pure, and it's because of what God's done in my heart and my life. I couldn't clean me up. I couldn't do any, anything good or right in God's eyes, but God, and I'll tell you something else, that, that Lord help me on this, because I think this might offend people. The Lord doesn't look at me through rose-colored glasses, and people say that He views me through his son Jesus Christ. And this is where I say. This is a change. No it's because of what his son has done in me. That I am I'm a changed creature. That he can look at me and say. He is covered by the blood. Now he's righteous. And he's pure. And he's holy. He's not. I mean. It's, it's, and the thing is. The righteousness is not my own. My righteousness was given to me by Christ. And if Christ is righteous, and if Christ is pure and holy, and he says, Christ lives and dwells, and in him we live and move and have our being. Doesn't the Bible say, you are complete in him? Yes. Amen. Amen. So, when you look at this idea of holiness, and you look at the call. See, the, the call was, see, this isn't... This isn't um, a suggestion. I guess that's what I'm trying to say about the entire thing. When you look at this idea that God wants you to be pure. God wants you to be spotless. God wants you to live a life of holiness and purity before Him. And in this world, this is not a suggestion. He says, listen, this is an active word. He doesn't say, I think you ought to strive to be holy. Oh, He says, be holy because I'm holy. And you, and you look at it and say, I can't be holy. No, I, you know, it's like I was saying before. I can do all the right things and all the right work. But I'm in and of myself. There is no holiness. But God makes me holy because of what Jesus Christ did. That's why he died. The Bible tells me that he suffered without the gate to sanctify the people. Whew, I like that. Without the gate to sanctify. Not just the idea of setting them apart as something chosen. But the idea of when I'm sanctified. I'm not just set apart. A lot of people just look at that and say sanctified. We set these vessels apart. No, that's just part of it. The other part in that is they're set apart to be used. But they're made holy. You know, all the things that God had done, He made them holy. He didn't come into the tabernacle until everything was right, and then God made it holy. Not all the things that mankind did. They did all the things and all the instructions that God gave them to do, but it didn't make it holy. It wasn't holy till He came in. Right. Amen? Amen? And the temple, the same thing with the temple. All the vessels were set aside. Everything was laid aside. They did all the right things. But it's like it wasn't holy until he invaded it. Amen. Until he invaded it. And God made it holy. And then when God made it. You remember what. And I said this the other night. You remember what happened when God came in and made it holy. Everybody fled because they couldn't stand the glory and the, and the power of God. I hope it. With, and this, and oh, phew, I like that idea. When it was torn apart, and now he invades our, invades our hearts and our souls. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which you have of God, and you are not your own, for you're bought with a price? Then it tells me, and Paul's saying, this is my prayer. Not that you strive and work at these things, but that you be these things. That you be blameless. He made up words. Uh, one of the most, probably one of the greatest minds ever that you see in Scripture Made up words. I'm not going to get into all of them, but I just, I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of like one of the, uh, how do I say it? Super, super grace. Yeah. 
And it's kind of like that. That's a made up word, right? But he's like, there's nothing that can, that I have, you know, Paul's like, when he's writing the Greek under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I like that too, that the Bible is the inerrant, infallible, inspired word of God. But under this, God himself using Paul is having Paul write something that's like, there's not a word on this earth that can describe what I can do. There's not a word that man has that will describe the depth that I can cleanse. There's not anything that man can give. It's mine. So he goes, here, Paul, here, make up a word. And that word will describe the, the depths of my purity, the depths of my love. And the whole thing about it is, it's, it's, not, it's not a suggestion. It's not an idea to be hoped for. Boy, I'm just going to do my best and hope. No, no, no. The assurance is founded in Jesus Christ. The assurance of sanctification. The assurance of heart holiness. The assurance and the promise. God would not call you to be something that He would not enable you to be. Amen? Why would God say, be this? And He says, you can't do it. Why would He ask that of you? It's like, I want you to be this. And it's like, well, I can't be that. Well, I'm, going, I'm sorry, I'm going to judge you and, and talk. Amen, sister. He would never ask that of anybody. And what is his call and what is his cry in the Old Testament? Be ye holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. In the New Testament, be ye holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. What did Jesus say in Matthew 5, 48? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. And I'm like, boy, look at me, and I'm like, I know I can't do that. I mean, in and of myself, I know I'm not. We look and say, well, you failed here. But, but the estimation and the judgment is not man's idea of holiness. It's what God does in the heart. Amen? What God does in the heart and the soul of a man. When he takes that horrible, that horrible thing that battles and says, I don't want you and I don't want to live this way. And he says, I'll rip that thing out of you. I'll circumcise out of, out of your heart. I'll destroy it. And I'll put my spirit in there. Woo! I like that. When he says, I'll put my spirit in there. There's nothing greater than to have the Spirit of the living God dwelling in the heart and soul of a man. What a thrill. You know, you look at the times all through. That's why I don't want to offend anybody when I say this, but that's why I say Calvary wasn't the pinnacle of the work of Christ. It's when He ascended and He sent the Holy Spirit. He sent the promise of the Father. Remember, He even told Him, He says, Go back to Jerusalem. You go back there and wait for the promise. What promise? The promise that I was going to die and rise again? No, the promise that I'm going to put my spirit in your heart. And I'm going to make you something that you could never be through any work or any righteousness of your own. I'll do it. I'll do it. And I'll call you to it. And I promise you, that's God's promise. God wants you to be holy. Amen. God wants you to be holy. Quit trying. You know, it's like, what, what is that? Old Larnell Harris. She said, well, old Larnell Harris. She, Larnell Harris sang a song. I believe it was him. And he said, it's not in trying, but in trusting. Yes. It's not in running, but in resting. It's not in wandering, but in praising. That we find the strength of the Lord. All the things that every promise that God has given you and me. All the promises of God in Christ are what does he say? I want to say in Corinthians. I got to go back and read it. Are yes and amen. He said all, all the promises are yes and amen. And his promises in I want Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 16. Is it 30 16 or 30, 30 verse 6? But the promise was God's spirit to dwell in man. He said, I'm going, I promised that. And he did that on the day of Pentecost. And now he says, I have something that I want you to be. I'm calling you to, to be this. Well, then how do I do it? Only two things I ever see that made this happen. Uh, a complete consecration and just giving up everything I got and be totally devoted to him. And he promises this is the way I'll do when you do this. Amen. I, I don't get it why people. <laughs> I like that. It's not in trying but in trusting. Because I trust him. God that cannot lie. I like that. 
God that cannot lie. You know, he promised many of these things before the world began. And he promised, he promised holiness of heart. And he calls you to holiness of heart. You know, um, to, 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 well, the only way I can say that is that when God says, this is what I'm calling you to do, and I'm calling you to be this, and I'll, and I'll take care of it. I will cleanse. I will purify. I will fill with my spirit. That is my promise. But if you don't bring yourself to him and just yield up and give up everything so he can cleanse and give it up, um, it's disobedience. That's what he said there in that uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verses 3 through 8. And I want to say maybe it's verses 7 and 8 where he says, uh, you're despising not men, but you're despising God. Oh, child of God. Quit trying to be something that you cannot be and that God has called you to be and let him perform a work in you. <laughs> I mean, just, yeah. No. Yes. Do you want to now? That's fine. If you want to come and pray, we're more than happy to come and pray. We'll stop right where we're at right now and we're done. I'm done. All I'm just saying is we, this is what God's calling us to do. And, and, and if you want to come and pray, I'd rather pray than preach. Normal, come up. Jim, come up. Let's come pray with his sister.